In our first episode of Humanity Tskudu, we talk with Pasquale Romero, a personal friend who has a whole history of fascinating work behind him. From playing in several popular bands to working on a variety of TV and movie gigs over the years, we talk with Pasquale today to see just what it is that makes him contribute to our own humanity. So, like, the first thing I made was uh, 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 just a pen, and it was a pen that you could click in and out, and it looked like a pen. It even had a ballpoint in it, and you could write with it. But behind the ballpoint, I actually inserted a syringe that when you push the plunger all the way down, it pops through the ballpoint and the needle tip pops out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Humanity Tskudu, Humanity's podcast. Uh, so with us today on the very first episode was the man who helped me put this all together, none other than my own local celebrity, Pasquale Romero. Hey, hey. Pasquale. <laughs> good, good. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, putting the show together uh, hinged largely on a lot of your experience with uh, podcasting, which I'd love to get into uh, in just a little bit. But uh, what I wanted to do uh, first and foremost was actually introduce you. Um, as I understand, it, your name is Pasquale. Last I checked, yes. Okay, good. How often do you check? Uh, actually not that often now that I think of it. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Okay. You're, you're, you're pretty sure in this one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, and, uh, many people know you from a lot of things. You are a man who networks more than myself, which is already a pretty significant amount. Uh, but you, um, as I understand, have been in, involved in several bands, several large bands, including, uh, the bassist for in this moment. Yeah, so that was um, my twenties were largely uh, consumed by uh, a career in the music business, um, playing in a lot of metal, uh, metal, hard rock, you know, kind of a bunch of different stuff, a little bit of punk even. Um, but in this moment, it was kind of my biggest band, uh, and then I was uh, involved with lots of other bands over the years and did a lot of touring. Um, but yeah, that was that was uh, pretty much my entire twenties until I basically soft retired at age 30. So I, I like put a full decade in and called it mostly quits. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, you still play guitar occasionally and you you're, I don't know if you're uploading any material or you're just practicing and having fun, you know, sharing that with people. What's uh, what's your current status with that? Yeah. So I, um, I still do put out some music. Um, I have a project with my uh, old roommate Art Burdick Marquez in LA um, called Strangled by Strangulation, which is a very tongue in cheek death metal project. So we uh, do a lot of kind of funny songs. Um, it, it's funny because we predated uh, Death Clock uh, Metalocalypse by, by just a hair, uh, but that was really the vibe we were trying to put forth was just this sort of ridiculous parody of death metal. But very legit death metal. And so we actually uh, include a lot of uh, pretty big people in the death metal world uh, as guests on our songs. Um, and we, we do have a couple of, uh, you know, basically recurring members from larger bands like Morbid Angel and uh, uh, a couple others. But, um, and then, uh, so that one we put out songs, you know, when we feel like it. Um, we, uh, I also do have a band with my wife, Ashley called Devil's Throne which is sort of a, uh, a doom metal band. Uh, we call it blackened doom metal. Um, that sounds extremely yeah. heavy. It's very dark. <laughs> it's very dark. Um, <laughs> and it, it's cool. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We just kind of get together with our friends and play when we can. We've done a couple festivals and um, we have like one song on Spotify right now, but um, we actually do plan on finishing at least a couple more songs uh, probably early to mid next year. Uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I've always got my hand in something. Um, I did tour, uh, my last tour was actually in 2015 with a band called Intronaut and we were touring, supporting a, a band, uh, called between the buried and me and uh, another right. band called enslaved, uh, which are both pretty, pretty well-known bands. Um, and, uh, that was a lot of fun. That was just a uh, tour managing gig. So I wasn't actually playing, but just, uh, keeping keeping the cats herded so to speak but sure uh, that was a pretty brutal uh it was about a month and a half so yeah it was like a six-week tour 
Um, and we had two, two days off in the entire thing. And, uh, which is not uncommon. Um, but, uh, you know, it just kind of reminded me, you know, in my mid thirties, I was like, you know, I really think I'm good. Like, I don't really need to do this anymore. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun, but as you get older and you have family at home and stuff, it gets a little harder to be gone that much. Sure. Okay. So music has obviously been a huge part of your career. Uh, as I understand, you've also, you've worked uh, in, I mean, Hollywood, you've been a production assistant on shows, I believe. Um, I guess I don't know what uh, many of your specific titles are, but uh, what's what's great about you, and I've, I've known you for maybe about a year and a half, maybe two years, mm-hmm. uh, is every time we talk about something or someone or a tv show or a film or whatever it is you have this sort of inexplicable connection to all of it and i i'm thrilled every single time uh so you had your hand in the death metal scene uh you've also you know i'll just say hey you know uh, static x you know is as a band <laughs> oh yeah hey I, I partied with wayne static or whatever sure, sure. <laughs> some delightful connection to it uh but hollywood and um the uh, the movie and film scene as well. I mean, what, what, what was that like? And what were some of your experiences, uh, sort of starting off with that? Yeah. So, um, in LA, it's not hard to, uh, sort of walk in both worlds, uh, music and film, um, because they both are kind of by nature inconsistent. And so you can just kind of time out your, your work. Um, so when I wasn't on tour, I could just take a gig on a show or a movie. Um, when I, uh, when I, you know, was touring, I could just, you know, tour and not have to worry about, it. I could even leave a show and no, it wouldn't, you know, didn't, it wasn't burning bridges or anything as long as I gave them a heads up. Um, what started it all actually was, uh, when I was, uh, in my early years and this is like 2000, 2001, probably about 2001, 02, maybe. Um, I, uh, I, connected with a guy, uh, named Adrian over at Lionsgate, um, because they were starting to do marketing that would sort of cross over into the music world. So they'd, they'd have bands, um, you know, wearing merch from movies or giving, you know, there'd be, they'd be given out merch, like just kind of swag for movies. Um, because Lionsgate at the time was actually a pretty, pretty small kind of indie company. I mean, they had a good, uh, number of movies under their belt, but they never had any major mainstream hits at that point. Um, and when Rob zombie was doing house of a thousand corpses, that's when I got involved. So I got involved on the street marketing level on that film. Um, and it was perfect because I was in the metal scene and it was like just a perfect fit. I also had connections with the zombie camp. Um, and I was just sort of, it just, it was a very natural move into that, um, and just sort of pairing it with music. And then, uh, you know, within a few years, I, I actually, I did a bunch of marketing for Lionsgate, um, for a bunch of their films. Um, and then, um, basically I just transitioned into working in TV from there and as a product production assistant, as you mentioned, um, and I was working on shows like heroes and I was doing stuff for JJ Abrams, like lost and a show called what about Brian, which was, um, actually a really fun show with, uh, Tiffany Amber Thiessen and Barry Watson. And, um, we, and then, I, and then I just kept, it just kind of snowballed it. You know, you work on one show, you know, people on that show, they go to another show, they call you up and ask if you need a gig and you just sort of show up. And then, uh, eventually, um, between kind of bouncing between touring and TV, I ended up falling into, uh, producer level work in reality TV, not really reality, but, uh, 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 shows for kind of day in the life shows for the E channel and the style network. So not quite um, like a Jersey shore or real yeah, world. Okay. Nothing quite that, that, uh, you know, that funky, but, uh, a little more like, you know, uh, following celebrities around like in, in their, you know, I, I worked on a Kimora Lee Simmons show and, um, some kind of fashion shows and, and stuff like that. So, uh, it was, it was, it was a good experience. I met a lot of good friends there and kind of had some, you know, made a lot of my contacts in that world as well. Uh, I also did a show called rad girls, which was sort of a, a spiritual successor to jackass. Um, which was, <laughs> I think uh, you mentioned this before. Yeah. yeah. Rad girl. That's an excellent title, by the way. 
Yeah. <laughs> and it was uh, basically girls doing the same thing that you would see on Jackass, but it was not a Jackass ripoff. As a matter of fact, our crew was very tightly intertwined with the Jackass and Viva La Bam crew. Mm. Um, so we were actually, um, again, kind of a spiritual siblings show to it. Um, but yeah, and that sort of just kept going and I did a bunch of that stuff. And again, it was just sort of bouncing between film and, and music and it was a very natural kind of rhythm for me. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, uh, you, you went from playing music, you, you did music first, right? Music was sort of like your yeah, primary music. entryway into all this. Sure, yeah. Okay. And, uh, then you scooted on to, to uh, movies and film, uh, and obviously as a, as a death metal guy jumping into a Rob zombie production, uh, and, but then getting to scoot on to say things like pushing daisies or bad yeah. girls or whatever, uh, you've gotten quite a, uh, a repertoire of, of experiences and, um, probably a lot of really great perspectives, uh, you know, and inevitably because what I know about a lot of artists is everybody wants to be proud of the work that they've contributed to the thing. But sometimes you get popped into a show or a movie or a, a gig of some sort, and you're there because sometimes you just need the paycheck. Sometimes you simply need sure. the work. Sometimes you need the networking. Right. Um, were there any, and obviously I don't want you to, you know, sit here and <laughs> throw any productions under the bus, but <laughs> were there any uh, uh, productions that you were involved in that just didn't tickle your fancy? It was hard for you to get sort of like inspired by, and you kind of like had to sort of just. Uh, trudge your way through until it was done. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, in all honesty, I think the Kimura show was definitely one of those. Um, I just, you know, wasn't interested in the life of, of a, of a, you know, Hollywood fashion mogul. Sure. Um, it, it wasn't that I didn't, uh, I didn't, I had no problem with her, uh, personally. She was, she was perfectly nice. Uh, mm -hmm. but, um, it was just, you know, it was that very high, high end Hollywood, uh, wealthy and famous kind of world. And it just, none of it, I just can't relate to it. Even when I'm working in it, it just feels it's a whole other world. And, um, and, you know, it, it, I enjoy kind of, uh, observing it, it was cool to kind of be around it, but, um, it did get a little daunting at times because, uh, you know, just people's experiences, um, in that world don't always line up with, with those of us who kind of came from, you know, more modest means and, and, you know, right backgrounds. Um, not to say, I think Kimura did actually start, you know, fairly modest, but you know, once you're in that world, it, it's just a whole different thing. And, sure. um, you know, so it, I it definitely, was a little draining to work in that. Um, also just the long hours and stuff. It didn't feel very fulfilling. It wasn't a show that I'd sit down and watch after we did it. Like heroes was a show that I, I, every week I, we got to preview the episodes and, mm. and it was like, that was a highlight of my week was like working all week. And then Friday night, we'd all sit down and watch the episode um, and, and see what, what, you know, this huge team came up with and pushing daisies was the same way. We, mm -hmm. we didn't get to preview them as a, as a crew, but we got, you know, when the episodes would air, it was just like, Oh man, this was such a fun episode to do. And it was exciting. Um, but you know, in that reality world, it's a little different. I also did work, um, on the casting side for a, a show called bad girls club, um, which you invested in rad girls and bad girls. Yeah. <laughs> okay. what are the odds? Totally unrelated to, uh, but, um, uh, that show was definitely, uh, I didn't work on the production side. I don't think I would have, uh, had the, the stomach for it, but, um, just the casting. casting side, it was, yeah, I was, and I was, I was really just a very low level kind of, uh, 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 casting, you know, I would just herded people. So it was, uh, it really was kind of a low stakes position, but, um, Do you I, feel like you cast them well. <laughs> well, I didn't even get to choose them. I just, oh. I basically <laughs> chaperoned them. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would just like took yeah. care of them and made sure they were like safe and okay. Well, like pick, yeah, it was just simple stuff like pick them up from the airport and go okay. get lunch and just kind of hang out until they need you. And, okay. and, and it was, it was fascinating getting to know these people. These, this was actually a season where it was returning cast members. So mm -hmm. they'd already been on the show. So they kind of understood what was going on. Um, so it was kind of cool, you know, just meeting these girls and kind of getting to know them. Uh, but you know, 
as far as the show goes, like, I, you know, it's not something that I put at the front and center of my resume or anything. Certainly. I mean, and at, at the very least, I think what could be kind of fun about even a gig like that is because if we're to look at like the bright side of everything is meeting people and even networking, and that might not get you connections necessarily, but meeting people is fascinating because there's just such an infinite variety amongst what 8 billion almost on this planet. Sure. Yeah. Everybody you talk to has something unique, uh, some, some perspective, some angle, you know, some background that's just yeah. so uh, diverse and uh, maybe you only get to peek at uh, a portion of that. But I feel like one of the best things I, this is, you're a networking machine and I very much love doing the same thing is because I like meeting people. Yeah. And so for even a gig like that, and maybe even the, the Kimura thing, you might get the opportunity to say, you know, well, what is the bright side of a show that I'm not invested in the content, but I'm invested in people. I'm invested in, you know, what it is that I'm learning from um, maybe uh, other people working on the show or people yeah. that are starting in the show. Like what do you get to, you know, uh, ascertain from, from that experience. But um, I think uh, when it comes to gigs like this, you know, obviously not everything uh, is, is, is your cup of tea. But uh, what was it like? Because as I understand it, a lot of celebrities, when they, they film a movie, you know, or a TV show or whatever it might be, they often, so I've heard, don't necessarily end up watching it because – they're they, they they've, they've involved themselves so deeply that the final product is actually almost something they're no longer interested in you know if you've been making the ice cream for 10 years you have no taste for ice cream right yeah yeah and uh so but it seems to me like it would be really rewarding as part of a unit part of a team to get to put something together that when there's a final edited finished product that you get to show people like that's a culmination of you and you get to see well i you know helped with this right talk to this person who was in charge of that what is that like to see you know uh come together you know an artist can put pencil to paper and be like hey this is my final drawing i got to do this but when you're part of a, a team that gets to do something that people experience worldwide uh, either on the big screen or just weekly on televisions like that's got to be kind of a cool thrill yeah. Yeah, it really is. I mean, um, and, and I think it varies and I think, uh, you know, not to speak for all of Hollywood, but I imagine a lot of, you can speak for all of them if you want to, That's yeah, fine. Yeah. just speaking as Hollywood. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, it, it's very, uh, it's very plausible that this is a common thought, uh, which is that, um, when it, sometimes you just put a, a little, into something and and you don't really um give a lot of thought about the the uh final product necessarily like you you put your all into the work you're doing in it but you're just not really invested in what it becomes because mm. you're just kind of you know just going through the motions and i and i think in reality tv that's definitely uh, a common thing like i never watched an episode of of really any of the shows i worked on with the exception of like um, I did a, a show where I, d I produced a gift giving guide uh, uh, for uh, a segment in a style network TV show. That and was that's kind the of one cool. you watched. Yeah. And I watched that okay. one because I'm like, I made this whole segment and okay. I like, I put all the products in and, but I wasn't the writer and editor. So like, I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I didn't see the final, final product until it was done. Okay. Um, and I really liked that. That was fun. I'm like, oh, is that I the one you're probably thing. most proud of? Like, I mean, in terms of like your direct involvement, like which of these projects was the one that like if you got to show somebody and be like, look, this is sort of like where I flourished and, uh, you know, had like the most either fun or input. I mean, yeah, well, so, I mean, the easy answer is Rad Girls, because I think oh, yes. that was a very collaborative show. And we are all to this day, very close friends. Um, uh, and but. I think that's kind of a, uh, the easy answer because it was just a bunch of friends making a show. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, funny enough, the show that I really, uh, I mean, I loved working on pushing daisies. I loved working on heroes. Um, those shows were a ton of fun. I worked on some movies too, like three ten to Yuma. And then the marketing stuff I did, um, you know, did a bunch of cool movies for Lionsgate, like cabin fever, house of a mm -hmm. thousand corpses, mm -hmm. uh, open water. And, um, but those were all kind of small contributions and, and I love the final product, but you don't really, I didn't really see the fruit of my labor because my labor was very like operational on all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, a show that the, 
really the very last show I did right before I left LA um, was with a, my friend, uh, producer and writer named Keith Cornell. And uh, he uh, brought me in on a show called Spy Wars uh, for the Science Channel. And um, and he kind of brought me in as just sort of like a, a fixer. Like he's just like, look, I, I just need someone who can do a bunch of different stuff. And so um, the first thing that I was tasked with was coming up with spy gear for the show, like um, just coming up with like ideas for like what, you know, could be spy gear. We had access to some real spy gear that we did cover because it was a, a, a docu series. But sure. Um, um, but, you know, he's like, let's, you know, let's come up with some some stuff that, you know, probably does exist, but we just don't have. Uh, okay. examples of it so so you might get so, to fabricate some of these things like yeah. you know, like what if this watch you know james bond has like a laser watch or a video yeah. watch or something but yours could be like what if this watch could like hack into people's uh i don't know uh, cars or heads or sunglasses i don't know i mean right. that's what you're trying to think of is like are you were you trying to go outrageous or were you just trying to think of like what's technically maybe feasible yeah. So, like, did they so give this, you creative freedoms, you know, I, I had a good amount of creative freedom. The big thing was, this was, uh, an episode about, uh, the doomsday gun, um, which is a, a, a massive rail gun that was created, uh, by this guy named Gerald bull, who, who was basically a defector from the West and built this was starting to build this gun for Iraq during the first Gulf war. And, um, and so, uh, we're talking like late cold war is when this all starts. Mm. So they wanted to make sure that the, you know, technology was kind of in line with that era. Um, but I, so like the first thing I made was, uh, 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 just a pen and it was a pen that you could click in and out and it looked like a pen. It even had a ballpoint in it and you could write with it. But behind the ballpoint, I actually inserted a syringe that when you push the plunger all the way down, it pops through the ballpoint and the, the needle tip pops out. And um, and it worked. I mean, it was a functional pen syringe that you could still sign a signature with. And um, and so uh, and th like that when that made the the episode, I was just like, I made like I like that's a created, this mechanism that works <laughs> and we even showed it like injecting into some uh ballistic gel and um and it worked and so um you know that was one thing we did like a a micro camera inside a sunglass case which uh you know in 2010 was kind of a a novel thing uh, by today's mm -hmm. standards that's not even remotely impressive but, um and uh yeah and i mean there were just that and then working with the crew was a lot of fun like we got to go to a shooting range and shot like all these weapons that you can't you just can't go shoot like mm -hmm. fully automatic uh light machine guns and stuff and sure um silenced weapons and all this stuff and uh uh hidden weapons like a pen that turned into a gun oh sweet um, okay yeah and and but just all that, that was, that one I'm very proud of because, and I also, oh, and by the way, I also was a, an extra in it too. So oh, um, you see me like as sort of a, a, I, they didn't really title the role, but it was kind of like, uh, you know, terrorists plotting. So me and, and this other guy who, uh, look, uh, one of the crew members, he, he was from Turkey. And so he and I sort of, uh, played like non-specific terrorists and uh um and it was fun i mean we weren't doing anything silly we were just you know like they were spying on us as we had a meeting at a at a gate in front of a warehouse you know and okay um but yeah that one was a lot of fun because i got to put a lot of creative energy into it and then i just sure. got to be involved with everything um got to meet all these like real life spies and befriend them i'm still friends with a couple of them and with a couple of spies yeah that's a good position that's the best networking of all i think yeah. I, i've got a friend in the cia well retired cia and uh oh, okay um and uh another retired Mossad friend so um and uh yeah it's again to the networking part though that's that's all kind of how that stuff comes to be so do they like cross check any of this with like actual science because is the goal to be able to like physically make one or is it simply to say we have an idea and at we just need to sell the illusion at least because i love watching tv shows where like they they get into computers or whatever and oftentimes i feel like you know the the, the screens that they portray is it has to be clear and simple enough for like the average household parent 
to be able to watch this and go, oh, okay, I get what they're trying to do. But somebody who's like, you know, involved in like the tech world would look at that and go, oh, that looks absolutely ridiculous. It would never yeah. look like that because <laughs> you have to appeal to a broad audience, but also like the people who to pay attention to details sometimes get little Easter eggs that go, oh, that's exactly what would happen yeah. be it science or technology or whatever. Sure. So like, do they, do they have like a team of anybody, like a consultant on board that gets to say, oh, this is absolutely totally impossible and super dumb, you know? Like, so really we didn't. So the consultants were the, were the, the, uh, the spies that were on okay. the show um, because uh, m- many Actually, I guess all of them did operate in the Cold War era. Um, and so um they were all very familiar with with spy gear. And 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 they actually, for the most part, the, the general consensus was that spies don't use spy gear. Like they did. I mean, there was some, like there was stuff hidden in shoes, and there were, you know, sure. and, and things like you know, syringes hidden in stuff, sure. Um, but the reality is that um when you're a spy if you get caught and you have a spy thing on you, then people know you're a spy. Oh, and right. so they were very clear about like, look, I, a, a syringe pen, very likely a thing that would have been used to administer, uh, maybe not necessarily inject directly in someone, but to administer poison into a drink or something. What if you had diabetes? I mean, you know, like what if there's a guy <laughs> who's just like, look, I could, I only have pocket room for one thing. You know, <laughs> it will, and that speaks to, you know, what, what a real spy would do would be to have some way to prove they had diabetes and they'd be carrying an insulin okay. pack. <laughs> and then that would, you know, it could be full of poison, but like, as long as they didn't test it, it's like, you know, right. the plausible deniability of, of a diabetic uh, patient. Um, but yeah, so, uh, but you know, they, they did rubber stamp it. I mean, uh, uh, Mike Ross, who's the Mossad guy, he, he was like, this is, very much something you would have seen and um you know it just would have been employed for very specific purposes in usually a place where we'd have control of the area so it'd be like you know if we were going to use a syringe pen we weren't going to use it like across enemy lines but we might be in europe somewhere you know meeting up with you know the person the target but um You know, he's like, you just have to be in, in safe places to use spy gear. Okay. Um, you don't want to cross into Russia with spy gear basically. Yeah. But, uh, uh, long story short though. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was really cool. Um, I got, you know, uh, quite a few pats on the back. Um, uh, Mike Ross himself said, uh, he's like, well, you know, in another life, you would have made a great spy. And I thought that was a, an awesome <laughs> compliment. Yeah, that's a hell of a thing to hear. If you're in the of like, you know, coming up with James Bond level gadgets or maybe even, you know, extending to like get smart, you know, style sure. things. Uh, <laughs> I think the idea of uh, presenting yourself in such a way that somebody actually says, you know what, that's, that's a pretty good concept. Yeah. That feels rewarding. I'm sure. Yeah. And that, I think that's one of the big reasons that show was so rewarding because I did make some good friendships and also just, um, you know, again, just had a lot of fun making it and the final product was great. Unfortunately, it is very, I, it, not only difficult, but basically impossible to find now. Um, I, I, there was a time someone had an upload of it on like YouTube, but it got taken down. Um, so I don't know. I, I'll, maybe Dark I'll web. Yeah. yeah. You, have to, you should call one of your spies to find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can find it on exactly. the, uh, Dig the deep, my friend. or whatever. <laughs> Okay. And so uh, while you're still participating in music and you're enjoying, you know, watching uh, TV and movies, and obviously we discuss it uh, weekly on our other podcast, um, you are now, I believe, a pretty high level service tech for uh, Comcast Xfinity. Yeah. So so I'm an engineer. Um, I, uh, I'm what's called a, a client solutions engineer, um, which in the tech industry also is known as a sales engineer. Um, and my job is basically to, uh, be uh, basically be an expert. So I need to know how technology works top to bottom. I need to be able to explain it to lay people. Um, and then on top of that, I need to be able to do kind of front end design, uh, of networks and phone systems and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it, I really enjoy my job. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I do think it's a really cool world to be in because it does, uh, kind of employ a lot of the, the skills I developed over the years, you know, mm-hmm. especially with networking and, 
uh, getting to know people. Being a people person is a huge plus in this job. And that's why it's a difficult job to staff because you need people who are uh, very technical. Um, it, this is, you know, a lot of IT people in my world, a lot of network engineers in my world. And, um, but you also have to be a people person, which IT is not necessarily widely known for. Um, sure. Cause you're, that's all the back end, really. Like it's not the customer service part is, so I feel like the ultimate goal might be to become so proficient at like the sort of engineering tech level, you know, uh, uh work that one day you get a call from somebody that goes, holy smokes, Pierce, uh, Brosnan really needs like his ethernet data <laughs> cap raised we we're, where's pasquale you know like the the dream is to to find you know not just like you know joe schmo down the street but like you know getting calling uh calling in a favor by name from gene hackman or yeah. you know whomever like sure. yeah, I mean, i'm actually trying to think of like local people at this point yeah. who are you know are feasible i don't know where pierce brosnan lives currently but if i suppose they flew you out to london if he's living there sure. um, you know like that would be kind of like you know we need the best guy in the job you're sort of like the, the CIA agent of the uh, Comcast world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, this job, uh, in a way that that sort of does happen. And, and but what it really is, is that, you know, a, a large company or a small company, I mean, a company, um, you know, has some unmet need, uh, which is, you know, typically that they just don't have a, an Internet circuit that suffices for what they do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of what I do is, you know, come in and figure out ways to bring uh, like a fiber optic network into their, their facility and and how it's going to patch in. And then I have to walk them through, you know, what it's going to look like and how, how the network's going to uh, interact with it and um, how uh, their different communication systems are going to come into play. And, it, and a lot of it is because, uh, you know, these companies, uh, it especially is true uh, these days with how much everything lives on the cloud and um, how much uploading people do, uh, you know, especially if you're talking like imaging and, and um, you know, com companies that do uh, drafting or anything like that. You know, there's a lot of files moving across the network. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that shows up to figure out a way to make it work. And um, so it is it is kind of cool being sort of relied on as, as a, I mean, again, my, my, in the title solutions engineer, it's, you know, I find a solution for, uh, what ails them. And, um, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, you know, every day is a little different and I get to think on my toes. So mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Certainly. And so now something I really wanted to get into because we've established that you had a, a history, uh, with music, a history in, in film and television. And, um, right now a job that you currently love, so the, the big question that I have and a, a lot of the uh, the reason I wanted to formulate this was not just like what obstacles did you overcome to get here? Because I think that's something that we get to explore all the time. But I kind of want to know what it was like when you were at the most difficult point of uh, of of any of this. I mean, you know, like maybe in music, you know, you were struggling with something and maybe it was depression, maybe it was loneliness, maybe it was uh, a substance abuse. I have no idea what any of these struggles are for anybody. And I kind of want to know what it was like when you were deep in the throes of like trying to figure it out. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I it, So for me, um, you know, a little history on me, I've I've dealt with, uh, mental health issues my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've had depression my whole life. Um, uh, ADHD, uh, anxiety, um, most likely autism. It was never, uh, it, when we were kids. It wasn't really, in, unless it was very obvious, people didn't really test for it. Um, but you know, I, I've gotten by, so I, I, I'm not concerned with whether or not I am, but, um, the, the, so it was always a struggle. Life was very difficult for me growing up. Um, as you know, we're pretty close to the same age and mm -hmm. school was not very well catered to people like us. And, and when, you know, we had these challenges with ADHD, it was like people, you know, we would do great and people would be like, Oh, you're so smart. Like, why don't you just apply yourself or, you know, it's, Oh, and, that phrase I heard, I can't count how many times. Yeah. And so, you know, my whole life felt like I was always just, behind the curve. I was always like struggling to keep up. And, um, and, you Did know, you feel and, like an imposter syndrome growing up, you know, 
uh, it wasn't not so much growing up um growing up i i felt just that i was like the whole world is not for me and mm-hmm. i do not fit into any of this um i still was able to have good friends and and like my social life was fine and and um you know and i have very fond memories growing up i have a great family i i really do have a lot of privilege that um not everyone in my position had um you know we weren't rich or anything but you know we my parents kept roofs over our heads and everything was fine and um but it, it, going into adulthood it got very difficult um in the beginning just because it was like i didn't know how to um i didn't have the the tools really to be successful in in making a living for myself like it was it was difficult like i right. i bounced through i just a million jobs from like age 16 to age 20 you know and and which i mean a lot of teenagers that's how it is but it, but um but for me it also felt like i could never figure out what would fit for me and um it was tough because all i ever wanted to do was creative stuff and um i i even did intern uh, at a 3d animation studio as a teenager um and that's really in my early adulthood, that was the direction I thought I was going to take. Um, and when I got out to LA, that was the first thing I pursued. Uh, but it proved to be near impossible because I didn't actually go to college for it. I, I did, I did take a semester of 3d animation, um, because I already had four years of, of interning in that world. Um, the professor was like, you are way past the, what, you know, the skill level of this, um, but you know, just do, do your own project and then you can turn that in. So I, I was able to, to get a good grade in that class, but then I was like, I don't really need to continue through this because I'm, I've got the experience to, to leverage. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately at that time in LA, that was not something I could do. Um, so I found out pretty quickly that wouldn't work out. So, um, in the beginning it was a little tough, but music was always there. And thankfully music is something that if you just put at least back in, you know, 99, 2000, if you put enough effort into it, um, you could figure out a way to make it work. Uh, as long as you were working with musicians who you know had good vision and good drive to do things. Um, so I was able to, to, you know, kind of keep myself out of the worst of it at that point. Um, but fast forward to about 2007, probably 2008. Um, and, um, it got really tough for me. That was, uh, it was a point where I kind of, um, you know, music was, was sort of my main thing. I mean, I was still doing TV. Um, you know, as anyone who's lived in LA knows, it's very difficult to survive there. Even if you are working steadily or you have a couple things going on. Um, uh, so money was tight. I mean, it always was, but it, it was, um, it wasn't helping the situation. Um, and I think I just was becoming very disconnected, uh, as a person. Um, I, I felt a little lost. Um, and I just was like, well, I guess I'm going to go out on the road and then I guess I'm just going to do a show for a while and I'm going to go back out on the road and, and eventually got to the point where I actually had all my stuff, uh, in storage. Um, and I spent about a year, not even having a, a home because, I was gone so much. So I just, it was like, I was on the road so long that there was no point in paying rent. Um, and I just would come back and crash at a friend's place for a couple of weeks and then, you know, on to the next thing. And, um, and that period got really dark for me because it, I just felt really lost and I didn't have a good sense of like what this was going to amount to um okay so it wasn't like a goal kind of thing it was simply you were just accepting whatever was next riding that wave and then that was it there was no like long-term sort of like yeah. objective and th- th- yeah that was the tough part because it's like i'm not i it's just i'm not making enough money to to save for the future really um and i'm and i'm just in this cycle and and i'm like how to like one like the cycle has to end sometime. Um, you can't just do this forever. And you know, what happens when that cycle stops or when you choose to end it. And, um, and then just the, the idea that it was like, I just was gone all the time. And, and the only close people I had to me were the people I was touring with. 
And, um, you know, I felt like I was lacking a lot of connections outside of the music world. I mean, um, of course I did have all my friends, but you know, again, I was just gone all the time. So, you know, I I try to stay in touch as much as I could, but, um, that, that spiral got pretty bad and it was, um, you know, I wouldn't say that it, it was addiction that I dealt with, but definitely abuse. Um, I, I was drinking a lot. Um, it was becoming, wasn't really a crutch. It just became the norm. Um, because a lot of my touring, I actually didn't drink very much. And I, 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 I sort of, um, chose not to because I felt better just not doing it. Mm-hmm. And, um, but then I just kind of gave into it cause I was like, I don't know, I just need to like numb all of this. And so that, you know, it felt like my health just started declining and my mental health certainly wasn't being helped and depression was just really at an all time high. I, I had a lot of issues with ideation and, and intrusive thoughts and, and, um, you know, and, and thankfully just being around people constantly was what sort of kept me together. Um, you know, because for better or worse, I mean, even if you're just around a bunch of people abusing alcohol and drugs, um, the fact that you're around a bunch of people kind of keeps you from like going completely over the edge, but, or at least for me, um, sure. but, like with the bigger warning sign being that if you're sim- simply doing this in isolation all the time, that's yeah. a bigger sort of like cry for help that no one yeah. can hear. And frankly, that may have been something that kept me from settling down. Like I mm-hmm. just was like, if I stop, I'm just this, it's over. Like I, I you know, I, my roommate's going to find me and, you know, and it's going to be a horrible situation for my family. And, and, and that was there in my head. And, and I think maybe part of what just kept me in, going was the fact that I didn't, I was scared to stop. And, um, and it, it, you know, the, the good thing is that, um, eventually I think I just, you know, I don't, I don't know, like there wasn't a magic bullet. It just slowly kind of changed. Like I Mm -hmm. started caring a little bit more about what I was doing and I started feeling better about, um, my art and feeling less defeated. Um, and it just, it just sort of slowly got a little better. And then I got home, I, I found a, I ended up renting a room in a house with a couple friends. Um, and then I just like literally just quit drinking and I, quit like i went vegan i was like i don't know like let's just change everything and so um and i just like got home and i started just being better and and a a lot happier um and i took a break i was like okay like let's let's stay home for you Mm -hmm. know at least six months and just you know pick up some stuff and in that window was when i did that show spy wars um that was perfect um, so that was that's what turned you around a chance to make fake pens that got praise (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly (laughs) um you know but it it, and and that uh, credit to my buddy keith cornell again um uh you know he's a very close friend uh we've we are in constant touch and he 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 kind of just, he helped me out of it just by, you know, being like a, a good, I mean, he was always a mentor to me, but he also was just a very good friend. Um, and just, you know, sort of gave me, you know, a couple opportunities and then just uh, sort of, um, gave me a stable friendship that, you know, didn't feel too Hollywood. Um, and, um, and, and really to this day, I mean, we're very good friends and, uh, you know, he knows my family well and, and, um, and really, uh, I think that was, you know, that really thinking about it, that probably was the thing that turned it around. And during that time is when I met my, well, not met actually, uh, my wife, Ashley, though, we, we started dating in that time though. We'd known each other for several years. Sure. Um, had she started dating me six months sooner, we, it would have probably never worked out, but, um, but you know, I was just in a good place and, you know, we both kind of fell into the groove together. And, uh, from that point on, you know, I, I, I just, things have been good for me. Things have all been increasingly better all the time. There's challenges and struggles, but, sure. um, you know, I've had a lot to look forward to in life. Um, we have two kids, we have a nice house. We've, you know, like I said, I really like my job. Um, and, 
you know, it just, uh, in a, it, it was, you know, we moved home here to New Mexico, um, uh, that late that year I did. And then she moved basically around new year's, um, or I guess Christmas. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know, I guess the, my long rambling story kind of, uh, it concludes with, uh, things sort of being a little bit happily ever after, um, in the sense sure. that, um, you know, my darkest times were, uh, you know, survived again. I, there was no magic bullet. I, I know everyone's always like, well, what was the big key turning point for you? But for me, it was like, I just, it just things kind of fell into place that made my life a little easier. And, mm -hmm. and I was able to leverage some of my friendships and some, yeah. some of, you know, things that, that were able to sort of pull me out of what I was in and, um, and, you know, it worked out really well. So I, I suppose the, the moral of that story is, you know, you, you always need to look towards eat, people who love eat you. Your vegetables. And eat look your vegetables. Look towards people who love you. Yeah. Eat your vegetables, um, <laughs> served by people who love you. Um, yeah. So love is, uh, I know a philosophy that you and I do discuss quite a bit and sure. surrounding yourself with, with love and good vibes. And I actually did want to sort of, um, interrupt for a moment and say, well, in terms of like the philosophy of what it is that you choose to surround yourself with, because philosophy, there's no one thing you could say, you know, Kant said this, or Mark said this, or whomever said this, sure. but ultimately still it's an amalgamation of everything that we experience and decide to propel us forward. Or I, we, conversely, I suppose, decide what holds you back. But the philosophy, it sounds like you really chose to surround yourself with people who cared. And uh, first it started off with surrounding yourself with people. Yeah. And that seems like it was a step for you that really ultimately helped at least sort of like motivate your trajectory. Um, but as you know, you and I have talked over the years, uh, we've had a lot of conversations about just what it means to be a good person. And I know like, you know, moral relativism is a very large concept in discussion, sure. but you know, I think there's a lot of sort of core values that we could all sort of agree on for like, you know, treating people well and, you know, respecting yourself, respecting others. And like, that looks like a lot of different things in terms of like a philosophy, uh, in general, I mean, what, what would you say that you subscribe to in terms of how do you, what is good for you? And additionally, what is good for others? What does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, so I think, and this is funny because I was just thinking about this today because you and I have this, this, um, this shared view of things where it's that we like to like things. Yeah. And, and it makes us feel good to find the good in everything. Um, and, and I don't mean that in like the, you know, the, the like positive thinking cult of personality type stuff. Right. Like, I mean this in the sense of like, you don't have to like find something to like in paying taxes. You know, you don't <laughs> like, you don't, you don't have to like think positive to the point that like you, your brain wants to explode. Like, but it's like, sometimes like, I think we, we forget to just sit down and like enjoy a thing or just think about what makes us happy about something or someone. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's really, um, it's really important to do that. And, and, uh, you know, and, and our podcast, our other podcast, discreet error, um, we, we do talk a lot about that. You and I are kind of like the, the guys who always have the good things to say. Kellen's a much more, you know, honed critic um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and he absolutely valid points, but, um, but it, I think that my philosophy in life sort of is why it's hard for me to hate something because it's like, I sit down and have an experience and I'm like, I'm having this experience. Like I get to do this. Like this is yeah. like it, it is a, it could be a terrible movie or like music. That's not my favorite, but I'm like, but it, I'm experiencing it and I can choose not to hate it. Um, and I can choose to just sort of enjoy myself. And, and I think that's how I am with people. Like when I say I'm a people person, it's, it's like, sure, there, there are certainly 
um, behaviors and traits that uh, bother me in people. Um, there are certainly types of people that I have a difficult time with um, right now in this country. It's there's a lot of them, but um, it, it's also, you know, that aside, um, it's easy for me to just like, you know, find a, like I, I are in the same space as a person I don't know long enough that I can at least say something to them. And, and it gives me a chance to just like, see what they're about. Like, you know, who are you? Like, what are you into? And, and, um, you know, especially when you're in a community space, like over at, at new game plus, that's one of my favorite things is like, I just randomly meet people and talk to them, you know, and, and we, we just find things to talk about, you know, and it's like, I'm sure I don't align with every single person that walks through that door on every single thing. Inevitably. But, sure. But like, you know, Hey, um, you know, we, there's a game we both love. That's fun. That's great. Like we found, like, there's just, there's a lot to like in people. There's a lot to like in, in the things we experience. There's a lot to like in the world at large. Um, it's important to acknowledge the difficult things and, and it's important to know that there's a dark side to all of it. In fact, I think it should be embraced that there's a lot of bad in the world. Um, not accepted per se, but embraced. I mean, you need mm-hmm. to just, or I guess accept it. You need to accept that it exists. Um, and, um, and, you know, and just like not be in a, in a constant race to the bottom with, with, you know, finding things to be upset about. And, um, I don't know, I guess if that makes sense, it's just, I, I absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. And so do you think that that, uh, philosophy, uh, is something that maybe changed for you at one point? Like maybe I, I can certainly say without a doubt when I was younger, you know, it used to be really cool and fun and hip to be like that guy who, you know, just trashes everything because, you know, it gets a laugh, but yeah. ultimately it's a very sort of tired personality trope. Uh, and eventually it, it's difficult to be around people who only care about hating things. And so I don't know if, if when you were younger, like if you maybe had that kind of attitude and then somewhere around the the, the path, it sort of flipped for you and you thought, Oh no, I do want to focus more on enjoying things because number one, it means I get to enjoy more stuff. And number two, it's more pleasant for everyone around me <laughs> to maybe be around somebody who likes stuff instead of hates everything. Yeah. 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 That, I mean, for sure. Like I've been through the whole gamut. Um, you know, when I was, I mean, I, I was, so I had a, a cousin, so I started very young when it came to getting into like heavy metal and stuff. And, mm. um, I had a cousin who was super into like hair metal and, and a little bit of thrash metal in the eighties. And so I was, I was a kid, I was like eight years old and I got a white snake tape and, um, and then like within a couple years I had a Metallica tape and then actually no the year later is when i first discovered faith no more as a matter of fact by mm. accident in san francisco um and uh and they weren't really a heavy band at the time but they uh but well uh, the reality is that like i just it, it, like i got increasingly into heavier and kind of more not as well some somewhat obscure but also just heavier uh, in general um and so by the time i was like 12 years old i was like just metal all day and um you know, I had the shirts and, and I like had my friends that I'd made at school and, and, um, and I spent a lot of energy on like being against other things. And it it was like, at first it was like, which is just, if I could talk to myself when I was that age, I would, I would just be very disappointed. Like, cause I was like, Oh, rap is the worst, which is, is, I was totally lying about because my favorite stuff when I was like 85 to 87 was like run DMC and like slick Rick and mm-hmm, like, the, mm-hmm. like fab five Freddy and stuff like, and, um, and that was like, I was actually like that, like that stuff. And like Michael Jackson, I loved as a kid and, and, um, you know, and, and I grew up on a lot of like soul and Motown and stuff. And but you and were like, trying to protect an image of some sort, a pretend image that right. we feel like <laughs> this is the people will not understand. Yeah. And like, yeah, it was like, you know, as soon as I donned the, the cannibal corpse shirt, I was like, you know, too cool to know who earth Wind, and fire <laughs> were, you know? And, and it was like, uh, and it was, it's a shame because, uh, you know, I do think back to that period, especially like 91, 92, where, 
uh, there was like this great R and B coming out and stuff and like, you know, boys to men and, and, and Vogue and stuff. And, and I was like, Bone I didn't thugs. like that stuff. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> like it was it, like, it's it, catchy. <laughs> I liked it. And, but I was like, it, you know, I just had to put up this front and uh, long story short, it was just, I was a very, uh, you know, I, I, I became kind of a cynical teenager. Um, and fortunately I kind of snapped out of that in my teens and it was, it was kind of in the late nineties when I realized like, oh man, like, I, well, you know, first off I, I played Spanish music my whole life, even during that time. And there was, I never thought of that as being something to be ashamed of. Like it always, uh, you know, it's part of my, I played it with my father. It was part of the family. It's part of the mm, tradition here. In cultural. Mexico. Yeah. And so like that never felt like wrong, but I realized like I got super heavy into flamenco and I was in a flamenco troupe in the mid nineties. And I, um, and I was like, you know, like I, I don't hide this from my metals. I, I wear the metal shirts to play flamenco, which, you know, cracks people up. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I, you know, it was like, why, you know, I'm not ashamed of this. Like this is part of my culture. Like, but why am I worried about, you know, people thinking, you know, like, Oh, he listens to rap or, you know, and, and it's like, and it just sort of peeled away at that point. I was like, like if I can do, if I can live in these two worlds, I can live in all of these worlds. And sure. so, um, and so, so it sort of fell away. And so by the time I moved to LA, like it had fully shed. And I was like, I was like, I can just wear what I like on my sleeve. Like there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure. Like there's right. just what I like. And, um, and that really served me well in the music world because I never had to, pretend that i was like not into something i could take any gig like nobody you know like i played uh, like power pop in the early 2000s and i worked with you know a lot of like stuff that would be considered very mainstream and and even in the late 2000s i lent uh some vocals to uh, a band called uh, uh black veil brides which is a very like scene band um, and, uh, and my name's on the back of, uh, one of their records. I mean, you see it in additional vocals, like my name's right there. And, you know, to me, it's like, there's nothing, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm most proud of anything like that just cause it's not really my thing, but, um, I, I'm glad I did it. And it, it's something that I was involved in and, uh, you know, in, in a lot of guys in the metal scene, I'll be like, Oh my God, I can't believe you did that. But it's like, like, I, I don't know, like is that any worse than, you know, just working a job? Is that like, right. You you got the chance to do something. In fact, I think, you know, like, uh, unless it's a band known for like tremendously problematic behavior, (laughs) you know, I think getting a chance to work with like any sort of band, regardless of who it is already recording artist is kind of a thrilling, just like notch in the belt. As far as I'm concerned, you know, that's kind of cool. I think it's uh, the the more expansive the repertoire, people do get hung up very often on, you know, well, you have to like this one thing because this one thing is the identity. And if right. you don't have the singular identity, you know, people might think that you like this or that or the other. Sure. And ultimately, like, as we've both sort of learned, there's no problem with liking more. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, I do, like why, why, force yourself to only like some things like i mean don't get me wrong i have the things that i'm most interested in and most sure not everything will be Um, to your taste and that's fair yeah and there's certain stuff that really just doesn't hit like you know uh, as many times as i've tried like those those souls born games like are never gonna be (laughs) never does it but also what's great is you don't spend your time or energy like trashing it you know yeah and i think there's a big difference in simply not having a preference versus like going out of your way to be like oh by the way you know i hate that thing that you love (laughs) you know and feeling the need to announce it every time it gets brought up you know like the guy just pops his head in the room every time to just be like yep that thing sucks (laughs) and then disappears without you know rebuttal (laughs) exactly yeah so no that's yeah that's that's where i'm at and uh you know um i will say that like there the being a little bit cynical about people took me a little longer um, sure. than, than kind of getting myself out of my niche problems. Um, but that really just required me um, looking for the good in people, um, not necessarily by ignoring the bad, but right. I think uh, the problem with the problem with the way the world appears to people a lot is that they only see 
the things they disagree with and they only see the people who are doing the bad things. But Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Rogers said it, you know, he's like, look for the helpers. Like there's always someone helping. And, um, and I feel like the, the people doing the best are the ones you're not noticing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's, that's what you have to keep in mind. It's like for every one person who, you know, acts poorly in, in a social situation, there's like 10 people who aren't doing that. And, you know, or 50 people. I mean, it's, it's really a, a high proportion of people that aren't being bad right. uh, or aren't being horrible. Um, and, and I think that like, it's good to just be able to look at humanity with a little more of a, a, a you know, sympathetic eye because it's, um, you know, it's easy to just think everything's terrible and everything's going down the drain. And there are some massive challenges that we have right now, Mm -hmm. socially and politically, but, um, but at the same time, it's like, I am surrounded by people who want to change that. And to me, that's like, I can't help but think most people like want better. So I, I think that, you know, maybe we have a little trouble landing on the same points with some of the details, but, um, you know, I, I think, I think I, you know, pretty strongly believe most people are good and it's, you know, you kind of have to like, at least for me, I had to just get myself to like, accept that it's like the world's not out to get me. People aren't just, you know, horrible and lying and terrible. It's like, you know, it's just that the people that do that stuff tend to, you know, get pushed to the forefront and you see it. And, right. And, yeah. yeah I, so. I do agree that I think a lot of people really um, at the core, I think, have the same kind of values. You know, we do have different uh, backgrounds and upbringings. But I think, you know, uh, sinister or odious behavior, maybe is a better word. It comes from a place of usually pain or hurt. And it's people want to be understood. Everybody wants to be listened to. Everybody wants to be heard. And so when we see bad behavior, I don't want to immediately condemn somebody. I want to say, well, this comes from a place of some sort of pain. So what is the root of that pain? And how do we address that in order to lead an example of how people can move forward? You know, not I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to make you do the thing because that obviously does not work. But when we when you and I see people we see bad behavior as this is a product of something else. This is a product of how they were raised or who they're around now, or, you know, what has happened to them, you know, what they were taught from any variety of things in life. And I do want to believe at the core that everybody has redeeming values. And sometimes it's, there's, there's fear, there's invalidation. There's, you know, a lot of things that make them say, well, if I do this thing that what I was taught was wrong. Yeah. And sometimes truth be told, what we're taught is wrong. So it's, it's up to us to figure out, you know, can we make the effort to change that? Yeah. And you and I've had very long conversations about, you know, these, these common things. And, um, I, yeah, I, uh, I think, uh, everybody has the opportunity and sometimes we just have to, you know, lead by the, the best example that we can possibly give also while acknowledging that we are sometimes not going to do that. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, as we're getting ready to wrap up, I do have a handful of questions for you because again, part of our own experiences is the things that we get to experience. Uh, and that is uh, a variety of forms of media, sometimes books or movies or games or TV shows, but also sometimes uh, food or even things that we've been told. So I've got five questions for you. Okay. If you could recommend a book that you're reading or have read, or you just think somebody could like totally benefit from, um, for any reason, what's a book you got? Okay. So, um, this one, this is a tricky one. So my favorite book is a book that, and I've said this about a lot of things on the podcast where the things I like are not necessarily something I'd recommend to everyone. Sure. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and my favorite book is that like uh the book house of leaves by mark danielewski um it's a very challenging read uh and and it's it's a horror novel at, at its core um uh definitely check it out if you're into weird subversive uh literature um but um uh, when it comes to something i'd recommend people read um maybe to to feel better or to get a little better. Um, there's this book called 
um, everybody else is a hypocrite. Um, oh, very good. And, and um, I'm going to have to look it up because I cannot remember the uh, the the writer of this. Um, but it is a it is a fantastic book. It's called "Why Everyone Else Is a Hypocrite," um, and um, and it looks at uh, evolution and and uh, it, it's a really interesting book. Um, it's it's kind of the the evolutionary psychology be- behind human inconsistency. Sure, uh, by a guy named Robert Kurzban, and um, it was uh, written in 2010. And basically, um, it, it sort of helps you understand that it's like you're just. Um, your mind is, is, is modular and like it, you're going to constantly have ideas and beliefs and thoughts that are going to conflict. Um, and it's in, and rather than allowing yourself to spiral into cognitive dissonance, you can kind of acknowledge that, okay, like I say, I behave this way, but I actually believe differently and, and, and vice versa. And, and it's a great, uh, it's a great book that, um, that uses a very scientific approach to, to kind of break down, like, you know, the kind of animal we are and the fact that it's okay that like, we just are kind of hypocritical by nature. Um, and, and it helps you kind of like identify when you're doing it. Um, so, uh, I really like it. It's, it's a fun book. It's kind of tongue in cheek, um, but it's full of really cool, uh, information. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, so I, I recommend that book. It's again called why everyone else is a hypocrite. Perfect. Okay. Uh, now how about a, a movie, a film? I mean, have you been watching anything or like something's been on the brain that you just, you can't stop thinking about some movie that like affected oh, you? Man. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty, but like, yeah. <laughs> we'll say in like the current, like current sphere. Yeah. Um, so I, you know what, I'm going to say it because I think this movie deserves a lot more than it's getting right now. And it's the movie black Adam. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Which we saw together and we both it absolutely together. enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah. And like, again, like, like take my, our, our shared philosophy of like, we enjoy liking things like take that into the theater with you. Just be like, I want to like this movie. I'm not going to, and not, I want to like this movie, but, but just say, I want to like this movie. Like I'm going to find things to like about this movie. Cause First off, there's I don't know why someone wouldn't like it because I think it's a great movie. But um, but I think it's like the the critics, like the way they talk about this film and like if this movie was just not for you at all. And like you're not going to find the things you're looking for um, when you just watched, you know, like, the, you know, some fantastic Oscar runner, um, you know, and and like I need I think people need to see this movie because it's just a feel good, fun comic booky movie with a lot of funny scenes and a lot of like cheesy action and uh but great characters and and uh a lot of fun like i think everyone should see black adam i want them to make more black adam movies i think the rock is a lovely guy um and you want them to take this like the fast and the furious route and just do black adam one through nine yeah yeah just do yeah (laughs) do do one where it's like adam and shazam like a spin-off <laughs> yeah you know what i'm all about it just That's, do it yeah i subscribe to this as well too i'm, I'm yep. gonna do it okay <laughs> um and now one of my favorite questions and i know this is like the first episode but what's been a favorite food what's a food that's on your mind what a what have you been eating uh, that's just hitting that spot oh man well I think you and i also share this one and it's just it's japanese curry like i <laughs> I, there is never a time I will say no to it. There right. is never uh, a situation where I will turn it down. Um, I, I could probably be in the middle of a stomach flu and be like, I will still figure out a way to put this in my body. Yeah. Even if I have to throw it up right after, but um, the, uh, and then of course uh, our local spot, Magokoro um, mm-hmm. has uh, the smoked bacon curry now which is, which is uh, <laughs> otherworldly if you live in albuquerque go there you should go there every day like just seven days a week just go there um and uh yeah so I, that's a food that i will always eat uh 100 of the time so I, I perfect i think about it a lot so yeah japanese curry is really hard i mean i don't want to sit here and make this this question about me but i'm glad you chose my favorite food <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty i mean it is my it's been my favorite food since i first had it when i lived in la and sure um when i came back here i was like do people even have it out here and 
you know, it's very. It's been a hard fought but... battle to actually get like uh, mini curry options in town. There's been a couple places that have come and gone, but uh, there's been some consistency recently, which is terrific for both of us. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay. And now, um, how about a favorite? This is a big one, and but this is going to be just the, the current moment where you're at in life right now. What's resonating with you in terms of a video game? Obviously, I have to Ooh. ask this as like a video game <laughs> related man. Um, yeah. What's what's good in the video game oh, world for man. you? This one, um, I think I have two parts to this one. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it oh, back up to this again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's the A and B part. Um, a, <laughs> I've been playing a game. Um, by Annapurna games uh, who, if you're not familiar with this publisher, they basically just make great, great indie games. Um, and every single game they put out, even if it's not a perfect game, it's just like swinging for the fences. It's always like high concept and different. And, and their games are just wonderful experiences. They have a lot of like really strong story and philosophical kind of things going on in them. Um, and this game that I've been playing actually has been out a good 10 years. It's called uh, Kentucky Route Zero, and it is uh, basically a point and click adventure. And um, for uh, people who do know me or know me from uh, Discrete Error, that is a, a beloved genre for me. Um, that 90s adventure point and click is, is very warm nostalgia for me. And uh, that game does it really well. It's kind of bizarre. It's a little otherworldly but it's it's um it's very stylized it has this cool kind of polygonal uh you know kind of flat color vibe um and it just has very strange and kind of esoteric things happening in it and you kind of like feel lost sometimes but that's what makes it fun you're just like i don't know what any of this is it's so weird and, um, but like weird is good. I think weird is great, especially in video games. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's not like a bad feeling game at all. Like the, the, you know, everything's a little, a little funny and, uh, I really like it. So, um, and then the other one, I just have to throw it out here is vampire survivors. Is <laughs> yeah. The simplest <laughs> game. <laughs> and it is like the best way to kill half an hour, just like throw it on and just, just play it. Like, I don't need to explain it. It's just a very simple, mechanically simple game with a bunch of different variables. But like most of it is just about satisfying the need to like, just get into bullet hell, but you're the bullet hell as uh, <laughs> I, I heard it described. Um, and, uh, and I just love it. It's a lot of fun. It's a great kind of mindless game, but uh, there's a, there's a little bit to it though. So it's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great choices. Okay. And then finally, if you could offer one piece of advice earlier, you actually had said something along the lines of uh, if you could go talk to your younger self, you'd be disappointed, which is <laughs> as most of us know, worse than being mad. Yeah. But um, if you could offer uh, a piece of advice to anybody, uh, including your younger self, what's that? What's something that you think sort of like helps work for you in terms of just making it work? Yeah. I'm, I don't know. Maybe it sounds a little cliche. I'm not sure. I, I but it, it's something that I came to on my own, um, after, you know, the very darkest periods in my life, which was just the fact that like all the worst you've been through, you got through. And, um, and I think that if I could tell my younger self, especially going into like teen years when it got real tough, um, it's just like, you're going to get through it. And so as hard as it is in the moment and as difficult as life can get in the moment and as stressful as some of the dire situations you'll find yourself in can feel, um, you're, you're going to get on out on the other side of it one way or another. Um, you may have a lot of work to do to rebuild. You might have, you know, a lot of other challenges to get through but like if you're listening to my voice right now like you've gotten this far and that's great and you can just you can keep going and and the world wants to tell you that you know the world's kind of the it's structured to make you feel like things aren't working but it's like 
like you're alive, you've eaten, hopefully, um, hopefully you have a roof over your head. Even if you don't like, let's figure it out. Like find someone again, like you, if you, there's people that love you. There's people that care about you. Um, you know, and even if you don't feel like that, sometimes, like sometimes you have to find that person, but like, you're going to, you have to live life knowing that like whatever obstacle you reach, like, like I, you know, I'm, I'm 42, I'm about to be 43 and I've gotten this far. Like I, no matter what shitty, terrible thing I've been through in life, like I've gotten this far and, um, you know, I know I've had it better than others in a lot of ways and, and, you know, just by virtue of being born in the first world, you know, but, um, but you know, just try, try to always keep that in perspective. Like you've, you've made it this far. Like you've every day you've made it every day. When you wake up, you've made it this far. Excellent. And congratulations to everybody who's made it this far so far. Yeah. And so it's a lot of hard work. There's been a lot of uphill battles, I think for everybody. So uh, we're happy that you're here. Definitely. Well, wonderful. And uh, so thank you, Pasquale, for for being part of this. I mean, you know, you've helped uh, shape my life in many ways. You've been a huge influence for me, um, even a huge inspiration for me. And so thank you for, you know, everything that you offer in terms of your your kindness, your philosophy, and not just the things you say, but the uh, the way you exercise it regularly. So um, um, thank you. Likewise. I mean, that's our, our friendship has has brought a lot to my life and uh and i'm really um very honored that you asked me to do this inaugural episode because it's uh it's you know it's it's a really cool thing to you know uh i mean it's fun to talk to a friend but it's also cool to like share your experience so i you know i don't remember the last time i did that and um um, I'm glad I had the opportunity to do this. Um, Absolutely. So, uh, the final thing is that uh, where can people find you? So, um, I, I'm never a hundred percent consistent <laughs> in any place, but, sure. um, uh, my Twitter does go viral every couple months for some reason. So, um, I, I'll do that one. It's satanic Hispanic. Um, that, uh, that's a good place to find me because I check in on it enough that, uh, you'd be able to find me there. Um, I also do have an Instagram that's uh, satanic underscore Hispanic underscore panic, um, where I do post a lot of stories. So, uh, it's usually just funny, ridiculous things, but occasionally I'll, you know, throw in a hot take here and there, but, uh, um, yeah. So between Twitter and Instagram, that's probably the best couple places to find me. Okay, perfect. Uh, so once again, thank you for being part of this. And uh, Pasqual, thank you for helping create humanity. We'll see you all next time on the next episode. Until then. <laughs>